Hello, Guitar Smarts fans. Before you check out this podcast, I want to make you aware of a cool new place where you can interact with other Guitar Smarts listeners. It's a Facebook group called the Guitar Geek Hangout. That's where we hang out and talk about all things guitar. So if you like the Guitar Smarts podcast, come and chat with Kieran and myself over in the Guitar Geek Hangout on Facebook. Maybe check out some pre-podcast clips and even get involved in asking and answering lots of questions from the other page dwellers. Hope to see you there. Yeah, the, the, I remember it being particularly nerve wracking at one point where we we drifted off uh, in the back of a of, of a car. It was a big big estate car with all the gear in the in the boot, uh, and Damien and I had fallen asleep in the in, in our seats in the, in the back. I remember being jolted awake uh, abruptly as the car hit the central reservation. <laughs> like at no. miles an hour. <laughs> well, I say hit the central reservation. It kind of grazed it, and we bounced off. And uh, yeah, so n- not only had, had Damien and I fallen asleep in the back of the car, but the driver had, had nodded off as well. <laughs> Greetings, welcome to another Guitar Smarts podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and thanks for downloading. Uh, it's really great to see so many people um, listening to the podcast and to see the podcast grow. So between the two of us, Kieran and I, we have collectively about 40 years worth of gigging experience and having gigged so often and for so long, um, there's always going to be some fantastic stories to tell about brilliant gigs, brilliant experiences and also some terrible stories from Horrible gigs, horrible experiences, and just, you know, that's how it is, right? You gig for a long time, you get some good shows and you get some bad shows. And that's what we're talking about this week, the best and the worst gigs that we've ever had. Um, And it was really great to reminisce. And actually, sometimes these conversations, they feel like therapy sessions, (laughs) getting things off our mind. But um, anyway, again, thanks so much for, for listening in. If you do want to know more about us and to follow us, then you can come to our social media pages. That's facebook.com forward slash guitar smarts and you can also find us on instagram our handle there is at guitar underscore smarts and remember wherever you listen to your podcasts please 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 press follow or subscribe that really helps us to grow and it means that you don't miss a show anyway that's enough waffle from me let's get to it how are you doing you're all right Karen? yeah yeah i'm good mate i'm really good i'm really good, good thank week. you yeah, it's been a it's been a nice week. Um, it is school uh, half term here in the UK, so my kids have been off school. I've taken a, a few days off uh, leave from work, which is nice, just to spend some time with the kids. The weather's perking up, which is great, so it's starting to feel definitely a bit more summery. Um, and so, yeah, life is pretty sweet at the moment, and uh, rehearsals with the new band are going pretty well. Um, yeah, little daily accomplishments at, at kind of getting songs under my kind of fingers that I've been like slightly panicked about going, oh, that sounds really complicated, but little, little milestones and going, oh, okay, breathe, relax. I can, I can, I can <laughs> exactly. do this. Uh, so yeah, it's all in all, it's been a really good week, mate. How about you? Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I've, I've uh, had a really good week too. I've been enjoying the weather because it's been roasting hot a lot of the time. It's a bit down mm, today, mm. but actually the garden needs it. So that's okay. Uh, same for mm-hmm. me. I've been, um, I've been doing more practice. I've been enjoying um, doing more practice, listening to uh, different music as well. Finally getting mm. out of that Steve Luke of the hole um, that I've been trapped in for months. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I, I found that um, I remember last time, one of the last times we spoke, we spoke about um, trying to target things in practice a little bit more. So I'm not just spending aimless time noodling when I do have time to play. And one of the things I found was, um, how do I describe this? So it's an app I found where you yeah. can you can populate a spinning wheel yourself with ideas. So right. I made a list of things I want to practice. Ah, um, okay. And there's, there's kind of too many things in my mind that I, that I want to practice that I have time to practice properly properly in a full routine. I really get tops about half an hour a day if I want to do Mm -hmm. some proper Mm -hmm. practice, maybe an hour. So what I did, I downloaded this app and I've, I've put a list of things in and then every every time I go to practice, I spin the wheel. 
kind of thing yeah, in this app. And it gives me, <laughs> it tells me, you know, it might be something like, uh, you know, learn some new chord shapes, or it might be learn a solo that you want to learn from uh, a Spotify playlist that I've created or learn chords yeah. or whatever it is. It just helps me to go, okay, it's landed on that. That's what I'm going to do now. And I feel like motivated to do it. So that's been cool. That's really cool, mate. I love the idea yeah. of that. Yeah. I and mean, the, the only negative is that there may be things on the list that I just miss that I want to do. Well, But in that case, yeah. I'll just choose to do it instead if it's... Yeah. Or it, or, in, or indeed, it kind of forces you to face into things that you've kind of put on that, put on that list, but would normally just go... I'll do that next time. And yeah. this, this time, if it comes up, you're like, you're doing That's it. That's exactly <laughs> it. It solves those two problems. One, thinking of yeah. things to practice and target certain areas. And two, uh, stops me from trying to just do the same thing all the time. I, you know, Brilliant. I have to commit to whatever it lands on. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, it's like, a, it's almost like a kind of random thought generator, but at least some degree of thought's gone into it. But, you know, yeah. what, what's going to come next? You've got no, no idea. It's kind of like, no, exactly you know, that catches you off guard. Yeah. It's like how my, my wife's brain works really when we get into an argument it's just like it could be one of 70 different things that gets brought up i've no idea which one it'll be but yeah i'm, I'm probably bound to have done one of those things so it's like a little russian roulette what am i going to get into trouble for today so uh, do you want yeah. me to cut that from the podcast just in- no no keep that <laughs> I'm only checking. I love my wife. We get on brilliantly. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah. Speak. Yeah. Moving swiftly on from random Moving thought generation. <laughs> yeah. So it's just been a good week. And I've also kind of finished updating my rig as well. Ready for, yeah. ready for gigs. Because technically my, my next, my first gig is going to be the 26th of June. I don't know if that's actually going to yeah. go ahead because uh, things here in the UK, at least, looking like we're potentially going into a third wave of this pandemic. Mm. We don't know yet. You know, I'm happy to do whatever's best for safety, health and things like that. I'm not going to be yeah, of particularly annoyed if I can't do the gig, but um, oh, we'll see. We'll see how we get on. But yeah, been a good week. Is that a wedding, is that a wedding gig that's been postponed um, and now is, is hoping to go ahead? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. so, judging by the, you know, the timing of it. Um, mm. It's supposed to be a fairly relaxing. It's a mate of mine who's booked it um, and, you know, it's meant to be quite a relaxed gig anyway. Um, but yeah, we'll see. It's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that it may be too soon given the way things are going don't want to take unnecessary risks you know i'm quite pragmatic about things like that um yeah. you know i'm not going home I'm not one of those people who's kind of like let's get on with life kind of thing you know we forget about it now we've done enough it's you know we should still play it by year and we should still do what's right um but yeah we'll see we'll see, we'll see how for the great for the greater good isn't it you know we all exactly want to get that. back out there we want to we want a gig but we've got to take uh, sensible precautions. I mean, Matt Long was talking about it the other day when we had him on the podcast. That's, right, and that's yeah. someone whose whose career kind of rests on on being out there and promoting and playing live. And you know, even he was saying, you know, it's got to be done in the right way. And whilst we're all keen, you know, it's a public health thing. And I think you're right. I think you're right around uh, certainly people being cautious and preparing for a third lockdown. And you know, in the industry that I work in, which is which is healthcare, outside of talking about guitars and, and playing guitars and all of that, you know, certainly in, in my industry, I know there's been a lot of preparations and readiness and meetings taking place um, in frontline healthcare settings to to plan for what could happen, which is a, a third wave. So yeah, so yeah, troubling times, but you know, hopefully, hopefully we're getting there. So I guess with, a, with, a, with the fact that, you know, we haven't gigged for quite some time and this is the summer potentially of going back to gigging, mm. there could be some good and some bad gigging experiences coming up, right? For sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, exactly. We're filled with optimism. We're, we're preparing our, <laughs> we're preparing all our gear, getting ready. Uh, is it going to be? Is it going to be all we'd hoped for when we're back out there gigging? I think it will be. I think there's nothing like turning up your amp loud and having that feeling of playing loud. But yeah, for sure. Like with any gigging uh, experience and series of gigs, there's going to be some great ones, and there's going to be some ones where you go, "Oh, that was brutal." So yeah, yeah. what a great, what a great. Time topic for today's podcast well that's the thing yeah because because we we've had good and bad gigging experiences you know over the years you you can't not have things like that when you've been playing for as long as we have right I, you yeah, know, I've got some cracking gig experiences and I've got yeah. some terrible gig experiences. I'm interested <laughs> to hear what yours are as well, because there's so many reasons why you can have a good gig and there's so many reasons why you can have a bad gig. And, um, yeah, and I've got some definitely. crackers. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I sat down this morning with a cup of coffee, uh, 
uh, first thing. And, uh, and I just thought, I'll just have a little moment of reflection here, knowing that we were going to talk about this today. And, I, you know, for the last couple of days, I've been trying to think about best and worst ones. And it's one of those things where I, I needed to just some quiet time to sit down on my own and just kind of regress myself through the years. <laughs> exactly. Because, I mean, this is definitely going to be one of those podcast episodes where I, I think we're still relatively young men. We're definitely not not in our in our in our youth or in our teens or even our twenties no. anymore. But but we're not. We're definitely not over the hill. So, but if if ever there was a podcast where it's going to come across slightly as kind of like ah <laughs> oh, back in my day or oh do you remember the do you remember the time when we did this? I think this, this is. It's going to be this one, but there's some great <laughs> memories that have been that have been dragged up um, from from my kind of memory this morning of some of the great ones and some of the worst ones. I dare say this is probably going to live with me for a few days after we've spoken today, and then I'll, I'll remember a whole bunch of other ones. Because when you look at it, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've probably been gigging for the best part of at least two and a half decades. Mm. So there's a lot of gigs in there, you know, yeah. interspersed with periods of, of, of not gigging or having a break from it. But by and large, there's a lot of gigs, which, which I've kind of had to kind of try and recall. Um, but you've, you've been, you've been gigging for, for about the same amount of time, right? Less, I'd say, actually. I mean, it's, it's an interesting point because I started playing guitar when I was 13, but mm. um, I was probably 25 before I had my first gig. I mean, the band okay. we were in, Roldan, right. was my first gigging band. Um, really? Yeah, I never, I never Do got in a band uh, or anything when I was at school. Um, I loved playing guitar, but I never, uh, I never got in a band. I think just too shy, really. To you know, um, didn't really know anybody else who was who was into music the yeah. same as I was either. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then did an apprenticeship, an engineering apprenticeship for four years, so it kind of went by the wayside then. And then I stopped and went to go and study music. Um, but I never got in a band whilst I was studying music. I was either working or studying, and didn't really have the time. Yeah. To be in a band on the side, so it was only it's only actually by the time I was about twenty five that um, I decided to join a band. So huh. and that's coming up to you know that's pretty much fifteen years ago. So well, thank goodness so, yeah. you did, and now and now the work <laughs> here, the, ama- the amazing natural talent that is oh, you all ever playing. So yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, in that fifteen years though, there's been plenty of gigs, plenty of yeah. funny things that have happened. Some some great gigs and some absolutely truly horrific gigs as well. I'm sure it's the same for you. Well, yeah, def- definitely, man. Uh, look, I mean, so so I, I want to know. Let's let, let's shall we start with an absolute a uh, clanger, or shall we start with an absolutely brilliant one? How, how do you want to go? Because I've got uh, a list start. of some. I've got some good ones and some bad ones. Let's 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 do an absolute clanger. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you're in that mood when you when you said yeah, there's been yeah. some absolutely shocking ones. It sounds to um, me like you've got one one that springs right to mind. Sorry to interrupt this super interesting conversation. However, if you've made it this far, maybe you should subscribe to the Guitar Smarts podcast. Go and do that now, and then let's get right back to it. Well, the first one, I'm, uh, uh, first one for me, which falls in the list of bad gigging experiences, is actually yeah. it's more of a it's 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 the overall kind of door to door experience rather than mm-hmm. the, the gig itself. I would say was average, um, but what I what what had happened to me was I'd kind of bitten off more than I could chew. You know, for the sake of earning a bit of extra cash, I said I'd do the the PA as well, and you know the lighting as well as playing guitar, and we did an acoustic set at the beginning of the gig of a wedding then we did two um two sets and then they paired us extra on the night to do another like half an hour set because they enjoyed it it was okay it was an okay live gig sound was annoying the setup time was too short so i was exhausted so what was the worst part about this gig well it was in devon <laughs> right? and okay. i was driving the bass player though who needed to be back in the morning to start work at nine in the nine in the morning the next day so so here's the timeline of events right i get up at eight in the morning on the saturday of the gig yeah up the van I've yeah. hired a van because I need to take the PA and all my stuff and and um, and, and the bass player's stuff and, and all that um, and I pick the van up at 8 in the morning um, I go and pick up the PA system I go and pick up all my stuff and I drive to the bass player's house I pick him up we drive down to Devon um, we get to the venue yeah so it's just so just sorry to sorry to interrupt there but just to say to anyone that doesn't know the UK geography it's not to say that we've got anything against Devon
Devon. Devon is yeah. a beautiful part of the UK. <laughs> it just really happens to be a, it just happens to be a really long ass way from from it, it, yeah. where where you were, right? It took me that's about a long five drive. and a half hours to drive there. There you go. Okay, that's a long drive, right? Yeah. So I, so by the time we get there, I'm already eight hours in to you know picking stuff up, <laughs> picking vans up, picking yeah. PAs and all this stuff, and driving down in you know, and it's not the it's not the easiest to drives, right? It's not like you just get on a motorway yeah. and go all the way down there in a nice no, easy drive. Little country roads, a lot of country roads, and I'm in a van, you know, a, a fairly decent sized van. Um, we get there and we set up and we start the gig quite early because we're doing an acoustic set. So there's been no time to get there and chill out uh, before the gig. We we play until about one in the morning. We pack down quickly, back in the van, and then it's a five and a half hour drive oh, home. Man. And then when I've dropped um, the the bassist and the singer who's hitched the lift back to Guildford, um, I drop them off. I then have to drive home, drop my stuff off. And by this time, it's about 20 minutes before I have to drop the van back off at the van hire place. So. So I'm dropping the van off 24 hours after I've picked the van up and I haven't stopped since then. Um, I don't really know how I got home, but I remember getting home and just thinking that was too much. I've bit a bit off <laughs> way much more than I can chew just for the yeah. sake of, of earning, you know, a decent wedge for the gig, which it was a really good, because obviously there was, uh, you know, it, you were, we were paid extra for the distance. I was paid extra for the PA as well as playing guitar. We were paid extra for the extra set of music. Um, we had a hotel allowance as well. Well, which I couldn't use. I just had the cash roll because the basis needed to get home. So it's not like I could actually right. book a hotel, which is what I should have done. Yeah. Um, and the cost of the van hire was covered as well. So, so it was, it was a good <laughs> earner, but man, I remember getting home and thinking I'd never, ever, ever want to have to do that again. I mean, the drive home was just excruciating. It was dangerous. At points, oh, it was, I, oh, I t- t- yeah. yeah. It's just, just yeah, yeah. disgustingly so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was fine. You know, I was absolutely yeah. fine. I took yeah. breaks when I needed to. Oh, very I good. I didn't just keep driving and driving, you know, or anything like that. If I needed to take a break for 10 minutes, I took a break, got some fresh air, made sure I had plenty. You know, it was okay. You know, I did it, you know, as safely as I could. But I remember getting home yeah. and just thinking, no, let's... <laughs> shouldn't be doing this i definitely couldn't oh, do that now you know i mean this is probably the best part of 10 years ago um, but i bet it still lived you with you for a couple of days afterwards in terms of the tiredness and trying oh, to recover from i'd say it, it probably took me a week really yeah to recover because yeah. i almost flipped my body clock the other way around right? yeah. it was like being jet lagged yeah. for a week um yeah. so it was yeah it was it, that was exhausting that's that's a you know one of my um I say bad gig experiences. It was bad in terms of the whole event, right? But the gig itself was okay. I have other ones which were terrible, terrible gigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, me too. Me too. So look, I mean, that that kind of made it as a category onto my list as well, which is and I and I've and, and I've and I've called it on my list of things in terms of worst gigging experiences, driving too far yeah. right, for gigs. So uh, I remember a gig similarly, which it wasn't a terrible gig. Uh, I was in a band, uh, and <laughs> I'll come on to what this band was a, a bit later, but it was a gig that we did in Wales. And uh, I, was, I was, it was in a band with Damien as well at the time, mm. who's been a guest of the show before. And we were lucky enough uh, on that instance to have a driver who was driving us. Um, he was a he was actually a family member of the, the lead singer, um, but he was happy to drive us on all of the long gigs, which is quite nice. You go, wow, oh, it's a pleasure we've got a driver. Uh, um, he, he wasn't the youngest guy; he was in his eighties, I think. Uh, but he used to be a professional lorry driver, so if there was anyone that was used to trying to driving long distances at, at night and things, it was this guy. But it was a I remember it was a long it was a long gig. Because, it, like you say, I, you know, we'd spent the best part of the day getting there. It was in Wales at some rowdy like nightclub in Wales. Um, we did the gig. Gig was fine, um, but then we realised we had like a four, five hour drive back home. <laughs> we didn't have to drive. That was fine. But um, yeah, the, the, I remember it being particularly nerve wracking at one point where we we drifted off. Uh, in the back of the of, of the car, it was a big, big estate car with all the gear in the in the boot. Uh, and Damien and I had fallen asleep in the in, in our seats in the, in the back. And remember being jolted awake uh, abruptly as the car hit the central reservation. <laughs> like <at 70 laughs> <miles. laughs> well, I say hit the central reservation. It kind of grazed it, and we bounced off. And uh, yeah, so n- not only had had Damien and I fallen asleep in the back of the car, but the driver had <laughs> knocked it off as well. <laughs> 
which wasn't ideal, I suppose. The only saving grace being that it was like four in the morning by this point, and so there was no other cars on the road. So we we, we kind of rebounded off the off the kind of partition in the middle of the motorway, and then yeah, the car was all right, not too bad, bit bit. It grazed up and we pulled into a service station and uh, got some coffee and, and went on our merry way. But it's one of those instances where you just go, yeah, that's like a five hour drive there, five hour drive back. It's just too far to go for a gig. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and yeah, it can get pretty, pretty hairy driving, driving back. Um, I remember a gig I did with you in the Cotswolds, I think with Roadrunner as well, which was one of the last gigs we did. And it was a great gig. It was a, a wedding mm. gig. G- again, the gig was fine, but I remember that drive home. I think you guys had hired a van. I'd taken yeah, my car. That was it. Uh, which, which I thought was a nice idea to, to have my own car so I could <laughs> leave when I wanted to and all of that. But on that drive home, I remember just thinking, I am too tired to be driving at this time of night. Yeah, and it's like yeah. three hours drive home. It was, yeah, it was brutal. That that was a good gig though. That I mean, that's one of my favourite gigs. I think. Yeah, was, the gig itself was great. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> It was, was great. <laughs> when the driving home, I remember just thinking, oh man, why am I driving home like three, four hours? And I think, again, it was a wedding gig. So we yeah. played till like midnight, one in the morning by the time exactly. we'd packed up. So we, we didn't we didn't leave the venue till one. So, you know, you've got like a three hour, four hour drive back yeah. home. You know, you're not going to get home till like gone three in the morning. So, yeah. that's And that's kind of, do you know what? That's my problem at the moment with gigging is that all my gigs since we weren't in Roadrunner anymore, um, have been wedding gigs or function mm. gigs of some kind. Um, and it's great to play, but I find, it, I find it a chore. You know, it's not as enjoyable as being in a band with your mates doing pubs where you, you know, you turn up at seven or half seven and set up, start playing at half eight or nine. And then, you know, you yeah. half an hour drive from home because you're gigging your local area and weddings pay better, but they're nowhere near as fun. And I like gigging for the fun of it. You know, I have a day job. I don't, I don't need the, the, the extra income. Income. I don't rely on that extra income. Certainly the last year and a half has proven that. Mm. And, you know, I'd much rather gig for the fun of it. And, and and I think all of my, I mean, I'm just looking at my list now, all of my worst gigging experiences have been wedding band or function band really? gigs. That's Not one single one that's been, I can think of that's been. Um, and in fact, contrary to that, looking at my list now, all my best gigging experiences have, have either been gigs with mates, roadrunner gigs yeah. when we were yeah. in bands together or, or other things. You know, that's, that's, that's really, you know, and... To go to another bad experience for me. So another bad experience was was terrible clients. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember being um, being at a gig with um, Connor Connor McDonald. I don't you know Connor, don't you? He he kind of yeah, depth, yeah, depth in Road Runner a few times, and he's you know he's he's a fantastic guitarist. I remember being on a gig with him, and um, uh, you know him he you know almost coming to blows with people in you know because like, you get to the end of the gig and you're like good night that's it you've got what you've paid for kind of thing and maybe the best man who's had a few too many and is probably a bit too much of a you know an idiot anyway is kind of coming up to you going why are you stopping playing what's wrong with you yeah. kind of thing and you know you're unplugging yeah. the PA and powering things down and he's trying to take things out of your hand and plug things back no. in and saying really you better get some music back on now sunshine kind of thing like trying you've to had that, you've had that happen. yeah had that wow. happen before at gigs wow. and we've just carried on packing things down and and yeah. just been like we get in the car and we get gone you know pack, literally packing a whole gig down in 15 minutes and getting gone because yeah. we're kind of like there's absolutely and to be fair you know if if somebody did that if somebody did that part way through a gig even before we're meant to finish we pack down and we go you know that was the yeah. kind of you know attitude that we took because because, you know, it's not really the same thing as doing a pub gig and trying to enjoy music. You're there to provide a service. You know, we should be a good band, but we're, we're like any other kind of wedding or event service. And there should be a standard of treatment that you expect to get. And the moment that goes out the window because of bad clientele, you know, being threatening or anything like that, then you stop and you go out the door. It's their problem at that stage. But yeah, I've had a few gig experiences where there's been, I mean, it, I think that particular one, once they kind of realised we definitely weren't going to carry on playing past the license they've they've found like a bluetooth speaker somewhere um and started playing music through it stupidly loud and the venue staff were starting to get into arguments with with the clients and i think somebody started throwing furniture around and we were like okay gotta go this is a terrible family (laughs) (laughs) who are these who are these inbreds but i mean do you think do you think that's um 
because that's an interesting one that you talk about weddings, right? Because weddings, when I looked at it, quite a few of the weddings that I've done have made it into my um, really enjoyable gig list. Mm. And they've made it in there for, for a different reason, which is um, that when you get the right wedding, and I definitely take the point, you, well, I've done some weddings where you just go, who, who are these people? <laughs> and who are they marrying into? Uh, it's always funny when it's a, a, one really nice family and then one really bizarre family, and you go, this is brilliant, this is just going to be carnage. Mm. But um, no, but, but I like weddings when everyone's kind of dressed up, everyone's there to celebrate, everyone's doing it in the right way, and mm. the band is an integral part of the proceedings right because everyone's looking forward to that point where you've done your meal you've done the speeches you've done all the pomp and ceremony and then people can cut loose a little bit Mm -hmm. and the band is focal to that right yeah and so you get people up you get people dancing and i've and i love those gigs where everyone's it it, 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 is not it's not the exclusive territory of wedding gigs but by and large i remember a lot of wedding gigs as being really great because people are there with the band uh, to have a party and to dance the the night away, and that can be great. But yeah, there's a lot of things about wedding gigs which you've mentioned and raised, which can flip it the other way. One of which is uh, a lot of alcohol consumption, and I guess that feeding into people wanting to keep going and keep partying, you know, yeah. uh, more than more than is reasonable or necessary. And alcohol can play a big part in that, I guess, if they because people generally, I guess, would tend to drink more at a wedding than they would if they were just out down the pub on a on a Friday or Saturday night having a having a couple of social drinks maybe. Yeah, exactly. There's always those people who just take it too far. And yeah. sometimes sometimes they're not a problem, but sometimes they they you know they try yeah. and get up and sing when the singer's singing. Or yeah, you know yeah. the or they in breaks they try and get on the drum kit and you kind of sat off to the room to the <gasps> side and you hear somebody playing drums. You're like, oh God, don't be don't be that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know who yeah. ruins it for everyone, and then you just get a bad kind of taste in your mouth for the for the you know for the people at the event, and you kind of it takes the yeah. shine off of it. Yeah, that's happened way too many times for me. I mean, you must have yeah. had better you know gigs than I did. I for me, I've got to say, most of my memories of doing wedding gigs, there's just always something that takes the shine off. Ha, huh, that's a, that's a shame. That's a shame. Yeah, no, I have done some nice wedding gigs. Maybe I haven't done as many as as you, but. Um, or, or I've just got lucky in that regard. But yeah, wedding gigs generally. I mean, there is a lot. There is a lot of downtime at wedding gigs. That, that's so thing. yeah, yeah. That that can be a bit irritating, right? Because but it's part and parcel of the day. I remember, you know, <laughs> yeah. my own wedding. That's kind of what you want. Is you want the band there, set up, ready, sound checked, but then mm-hmm. you want them out of the way for five hours while you carry on with the rest of the stuff exactly. that you've got to do. That's understandable. Um, I, I mean, that is, I mean, you know, uh, I remember, you know, my, my wife, Lucy, who was a singer in a band for many years and has done many, um, has done many gigs. I remember her telling me once that, um, <laughs> this was, this was the food she got at a gig once, right? Right. Cause this is all often a thing, you know, in the contract, it might be, you know, a regular yeah. hot meal for each band member or something. You might not get it. You might get a plate of cold chips or something. Yeah. So her and her, band for a gig once got given um, a loaf of bread and right. what they'd done is they'd emptied the bread out of the bag and then made ham sandwiches out of all of it just ham nothing else no butter no nothing stuffed it all back in there in the bag you know and tied it back up and then given it to the band and said there's your food it's just a bag of ham sandwiches oh, wow <laughs> Just a gradual thanks. Yeah, thanks. thanks for that. Well, I guess that's what we'll do with our music for you as well. We'll just yeah, our music yeah. will be the equivalent of some poorly made ham sandwiches. You know, you kind of get what you give in a way, but. Yeah, and that's just horrendous. I mean, I know we've had some bad uh, gigs with food wise, haven't we? With, with Roadrunner, I remember <laughs> doing a gig in London where we literally just got given a plate of cold chips between the lot of us as the meal before before the gig. I think it was at a hotel for the. Uh, oh, it was a big gig actually in a big hotel. That's on my. That's on one of my. That's on one of my best gigs. That was a great gig. <laughs> It was a that super gig. The, that was the that only made, thing that was wrong with it is, the, is they gave us a plate of cold chips between us. Well, so uh, I remember us. I remember us doing get, going up to and again it was one of those play, more pleasurable gigs into London because it was an, a relatively easy venue to get to. I don't remember being harassed by like London traffic. I remember yeah. us, you know, being able to get to the venue park quite nicely, and it, so that, all that hassle was was done. It was a, it was one of the posh London hotels. I, I don't know if it was the Langham or something. Uh, the like landmark hotel in like Malibu the landmark or something. 
Oh yeah, maybe you're right. Something it was like it was a ni- it was a nice venue, right? Yeah. With a big ball, a big proper ballroom. Yeah. And I I remember getting there, going, oh yeah, this is gonna be a great gig. They've got a big stage. It's a big ballroom. Yeah. Everyone's in black tie, or all the ladies are dressed up in cocktail dresses. This is gonna be a really lovely swanky <laughs> evening. And then I remember finding out that. Wasn't it, was it, wasn't the gig for like the London School of Music? Or, it was or, for the uh, uh, the Associated Associated Board of uh, Musicians or something. ABRSM, I think it was. I can't remember who it was, but it was basically the people that uh, that kind of they're like the standards body for music teaching or something like that. So they were, <laughs> we, were, we were we were basically playing to a room full of classically trained musicians. <laughs> and I just remember, I remember, <laughs> yeah, I just remember thinking. Do they know what they have booked? They have booked, like, (laughs) arguably the the south of the UK's premier Blues Brothers uh, outfit. But, but, But we're not, we're not classically trained you know professional musicians this is this is going to be you know what why have they booked us but um they loved it they absolutely loved it some of the feedback that we got off that band was phenomenal and we got bookings for weddings and other gigs off the back of that gig and uh yeah it just goes to show you uh uh you know yeah, one. It was a pretty decent. It was a pretty decent band. Was, yeah. We shouldn't have been so hard on ourselves. We were a good band, <laughs> exactly. and we put on a good show. But um, yeah, blimey. Uh, yeah, that was that was quite daunting to, yeah. to play to play for that level of musicians. Uh, but yeah, it was their Christmas the food, day, wasn't it? What, remind, was it their Christmas it party? Was their Christmas, was their Christmas party. Day? Yeah, I think it was a late one that they had in January from memory right and it was the ABRS7 which I just looked up it's the Associated Board Associated Board of the Royal School of Music that's it it was the Royal School of the Royal School of Music yeah so so they hired us (laughs) great brilliant (laughs) they hired us um, and and it went I mean we went down brilliantly didn't we do you remember that they had a it was a themed night as well it was like a movie theme so and I do now that you've said yeah. it. Yeah, it was movie movie things. So, yeah. yeah. So Andy, in his in his wisdom, obviously not wanting it to just be a standard gig, he created a playlist yeah. of music that was playing beforehand of movie songs, songs from movies. Right, that makes sense. And he'd gone through our set list, okay, and found out what songs in our set list had been in movies, and then oh, said yeah. to people, you know, um, before we started those songs, he was saying, if you can tell me what movie this song's from, you get a road and a hat. So he he used that night to turn it into an interactive audience and band kind of event, and it was he was so good at that. Was, stuff. Yeah. What, what what yeah, just the, yeah. The, what a legend Andy Rudd was at being a band leader. I mean that was that was the thing that made um, gigs like that for me so good was that he knew how to kind of intensify that connection between the audience and the band. You know, we were a good band and good at music, but he knew yeah. it didn't. You know, it shouldn't rely just on that. It, there should be a way yeah. that you can connect the band more with the audience he was so good at that so good at that didn't you um didn't I it's coming back to me now didn't you uh didn't you go on stage first before the rest of the band came out and play the top gun <laughs> theme tune on lead guitar over the over the I didn't. backtrack <laughs> No, but you're nearly right. He used, because it was the movie theme night, he used Top Gun as our entrance music and we walked on. Uh, is that what it was? One. Is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. Yeah. What a great rousing yeah, theme, ideas. theme tune that was. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the food. What that was wrong with the food game. at that gig? I can't remember the food it, at that the, gig. The ho- it wasn't. And to be fair, we should make a point that this that wasn't the client's fault. It's the hotel. The hotel right. basically just just was kind of I think last minute told to feed the band, and they just brought us out a big plate of chips to share between right. us with ketchup, and that's all we had. And it was you know by the time we got it, it was cold. Um, yeah, that was that was the only thing. But the gig more than made up for that for sure. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like one of those things that Andy probably would have complained about, and then we would end up getting like a full three course dinner being served to us because he would be so exactly, irate about yeah. it. Uh, I know. Uh, I know. Uh, it probably it probably resolved itself and we ended up getting more food than than, than we bargained for. I th- I'm sure I'm now that, that gig's coming back to me, I'm sure he made a fuss about it. 
it. It's, it sounds like real prima donnas, doesn't it? It's part of the contract, isn't it? That's the thing. It's, you know, when when you're doing an event like that, they come, the, the, if you're there for a certain amount of time as requested by the client, then you agree that they provide, you know, food yeah. at a meal time for you before the gig. And it's all agreed upon. And, you know, for me, for the most part, most of the wedding gigs I've done, the food's been fantastic one way or another. So, you know, it's just that there's some occasions where you go, well, that's not really on, is it? You know, we're not substandard set of people that you that you just throw chips at or something it's or, or a bag of ham sandwiches <laughs> yeah exactly and also you, yeah. you know you kind of think don't you understand that our enthusiasm for playing your what your your <laughs> event is going to wane <laughs> If, if that's what you feed us, we're all going to be a bit kind of, ugh, really? They don't really yeah. care about us. And and, and, and certainly yeah. for me, you know, most of the wedding bands I play in aren't fixed bands. They're just bands of dead musicians like I am, who turn up yeah. and are there to, to, you know, to collect the wage and do a good job, but move on. But it doesn't take much for them to lose enthusiasm for the gig. Um, and yeah. so things like that really make a difference, you know. It wasn't like that when we yeah. were in Roadrunner. In Roadrunner, there was never really anything that could take that enthusiasm away because we were there to play with each other and to enjoy playing yeah. music we liked to do it but it's different to, yeah. you know in your standard wedding band people I think people don't realise that really these days most wedding yeah. bands are just groups of musicians that come together for that gig they're not really a it's band it's true yeah it's true it, that is true but you <laughs> raise guns. you raise a really good you, yeah I hate guns for hire exactly uh, but you raise it you make a really good point though which is probably in terms of some of the best gigs that, that we've had is the fun that comes from playing with 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 your friends and a bunch of musicians mm. where you're not depping. I mean, I love doing a dep gig and, and invariably, um, you know, doing a, a standing gig for a band, you know, um, is, is good for kind of pushing your playing because you've got to learn a bunch of tracks that you haven't learned before. It can be a bit daunting as well, but there's something quite nice about that when you, when you pull it off and it's all successful. Um, but it's not the same as rocking up weekend after weekend and seeing your mates who become invariably like your family, right? You hear, you know, you catch up with them every week and you have a pint and you have a chat and you have a laugh and you figure out what's been going on in somebody's life. And then you get to play some music together and, you know, have some funny moments through a gig. And that those are invariably some of the best moments where you're playing with your friends who are in, in indeed in Absolutely. any long-standing band. They're, they're like your family and, 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 your, and your best mates. So yeah, that's, that's some of the best memories I've got is, it's hilarious moments with with my with my mates playing. Yeah. <laughs> We're just laughing a lot, and you know, <laughs> normally each other. But <laughs> and, I, and that's the same for me. I mean, my my list of, of good experiences is is down to the people I played with, not you know, and and the bad experiences of places and people I played for. It's, it yeah. is you know, it's not it's not a surprise really. Give give me one of your talk me through one of your better experiences. My better experiences, so. Uh, I've got quite a few. So that London, that London School mm. of Music or uh, Royal Society of Music was one of them because I just remember it being a wonderful stage. We went down really well. That was all great. Uh, I'll give you a few. I'll cool. give you a few. Right. So I've got a list of some of my some of my best best gigs. Uh, uh, there's another one with Roadrunner. I mean, we had plenty of, of fun and enjoyable gigs. It's why you know we were in the lineup of that band for uh, like seven or eight years. Um, so you know, clearly that we had plenty of good gigs to for for us to be interested in and and keep that going for for the time i remember a charity gig that we did with roadrunner i'm probably going to get in trouble for, for mentioning this but um <clears throat> right how do i describe this in a way that's clean and not going to get us into trouble uh so it was a charity gig and uh you, do you know the one i'm going to mention you do you're already laughing right so all i can describe it as is like uh we were we were hired to do a charity gig that was for a fashion show right? A fashion show in inverted commas. So I didn't really know what to expect. I thought, um, okay, this, this will be fun, right? So we're doing the gig and we're playing live and stuff. And then the fashion show kind of happens. And what I hadn't appreciated, uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys had appreciated it, but that the fashion show was going to be uh, basically a parade of um, a few uh, models uh, in, in, in their undergarments, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was like it was like the completely poor man's version of a Victoria's Secret kind of fashion show, you yeah. know, like the ones you see where like Bruno Mars is doing it or like Maroon 5 are doing it or Taylor Swift are doing it. We have these huge catwalks and all the Victoria's <laughs> Secret models come out in their angel outfits and the band are playing and it's all great. It's all in good taste. But except this one was done like in a village hall in the, in, in yeah. the Hampshire countryside. But I just remember thinking, this is really surreal. I don't think I've ever done a gig where there's been like... Um, semi-clad people wandering around like as but but it's all it's all okay that was the weird thing about it it's like this this would appear to be quite a normal thing that's happening for this audience and I remember thinking uh is this a is this an annual event because yeah I'll, I'll quite happily do this again, yeah, <laughs> even if it's for charity uh but b why is this being so normalized this almost feels slightly slightly strange but uh and, and i just remember looking over at you and playing and laughing and just laughing just being in, in tears of laughter going mm. i didn't realize it was this kind of gig yeah but- i remember that one well and i remember that you know terry our drummer used to always he had a he had a tendency yeah. to kind of uh speed up you know like most drummers do throughout, throughout the song if you listen i mean even if you listen to some of our record i mean for example the second album we did riding the roadrunner i yeah. think take me to the river was on that i might have been the first yes. album, i don't know but if you ever listen to that the beginning of the song is about 20 bpm slower than the end of the song and that's purely terry and it, like a lot of drummers had a that's tendency adrenaline. to yeah. speed up throughout the song <laughs> I think on that gig, he did it about 20% more than normal, you know. (laughs) I don't know what it was. It was adrenaline or just kind of, you know, the way he was, he'd speed up more on a lot of songs (laughs) during that gig. That was a great gig. I remember that one really well. It was a good gig, not just just because of it. It was an interesting, you know, charity event, um, you know, and it was great to be there. But that was just, it was just a great gig, wasn't it? It was such a good fun gig. Yeah, I like the way you tried to add a degree of kind of... uh, sensibility to that and musicianship when when really it was some very pretty ladies walking around in their underwear and us being hired to play which yeah it was yeah, brilliant we didn't miss a beat so that, that one <laughs> we never did <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. professionals exactly. professionals till the, the end. end we just we just looked over smiled at each other and went wow this is happening is it <laughs> okay all right <laughs> onwards gentlemen yeah, exactly. carry on playing Move on. I, I straight Move keep on. focused <laughs> they're, not, they're not here for your pleasure you're, you're part of the entertainment <laughs> keep playing <laughs> oh dear yeah, yeah that was that was a good gig uh, give us another one what, that what's was a another good gig one? Uh, another one's that stand in my it's stick in my mind. Um, I mean, hey, look, one of the one of the uh, best one of the best gigs that I did, just from a purely fun perspective, was. Uh, I was doing a stint uh, again with Damien on this one. I'm not sure how we got this gig, but we did it for like well over a year, maybe two years. Pro- probably he'll he'll tell us next time he's on the show. We did this tour of the UK where we were playing with every, um, they, they were called, uh, I think the venues were called Chicago Rock. Mm. I think that, that's what the name of the venue. I don't think that chain is going anymore, but they were like a hard rock cafe type. Yeah, there was uh, one in venue, my hometown. Right? Like kind of, in, in Wigan, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, well yeah. Yeah, we'll have yeah. played it. <laughs> so we basically got, we were basically on the rotation of the Chicago yeah. Rocks around the country, and there's probably about I don't know twenty twenty five of them across the country. Yeah. Um, so we were part of a I don't know if I've ever told you this, mate. We were part of a Simply Red tribute band. <laughs> did you know this? <laughs> did you know I did this? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's all going to come knew. out on this show. I never knew, seriously. Yeah, yeah, but it gets worse, mate. It gets worse. So, um, uh, so it was simply Red Tribute Band. So basically, these these this chain restaurants they're kind of like American diner stroke nightclub restaurant uh, venues that would have live music every Friday and Saturday night on some nice little stages and stuff like that. And then it would be a, a kind of disco nightclub afterwards, but they were pretty, pretty seedy and people used to go out and get very drunk and party and stuff, but it was fine. So somehow I don't know how through the, through the singer and organizer of this band. So he just hired me and Damien cause he was a singer and everything he did was on backing tracks. So 
it, it wasn't like a proper live band, but Damien and I could obviously mm. play. So we would just play play over the top of the backing tracks. Um, and But it was like not very serious because if we didn't play, well, the band wasn't going to stop, was it? Because it was all on backing tracks. So <laughs> it was all a bit, it was all a bit uh, funny. But, you know, you know, we turned up with our gear and we played over the backing tracks and it was all fine, but it was a very easy, easy yeah. gig. But we, it was literally... Me and him hanging out, going to all these venues across the country for a year. And uh, so that was one, one of those we did in, in North Wales, which I spoke about earlier, where we where we hit the central reservation. I remember one that we did in, um, I think it was on the Isle of Wight. It must have been because we caught a ferry <laughs> to get to it. So I remember. We, Ferries all we got to the Isle of Wight, apparently. Is that right? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to think where else could we have gone, which involved us going on. And do you know what? I was very, I was quite young. And I must say this was like in my late teens, early 20s. So there was quite a lot of kind of uh, irresponsible drinking taking yeah. place at the time. Can I just uh, say so as well, some of it's you, quite you a asked the question then, where else could I have gone if I'd have got a ferry? Can I just say Spain, France, Jersey, <laughs> go. Guernsey, Isle of Man, Northern Ireland, Ireland, um, Norway. <laughs> anywhere in the world, Basically really? Basically anywhere that's, accessible uh, that's by access water. Access by water. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I, I'm just trying to think. I don't think I, we ever did the Norway uh, franchise of Chicago Rock. So that's the thing. I was running through my head all the places where there was these Chicago Rock venues. And I think the only place I can think of it must have been the Isle of Wight. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I can't anyway. remember. <laughs> The only th- the only thing I remember about this gig was a very uh, hilarious ferry ride there, even more hilarious ferry ride back after quite a lot of alcohol being consumed. But <clears throat> I remember this being one of the most memorable stages that I've ever played on, because somebody in their wisdom and genius had decided to build a recessed stage above the bar. So the venue was like a typical kind of nightclub style restaurant type affair, oh right? God. Big dance floor. Then they had the bar, yeah. you know, like kind of standard cocktail type bar. And then above the bar, uh, about seven or eight foot off the ground was a recessed stage that you could kind of see quite clearly into mm. that looked down on the audience. But it was really high up, like into the mm. ceiling. It's weird. <laughs> but but also brilliant because what Damien and I figured out at the time when we were doing the setup and sound check is that all of the uh, liquor optics dispensers yeah. that, that 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 kind of serve out the measures because here in the UK we don't do generally free no. pouring of spirits right they're all measured out by automatic kind of dispenser mm-hmm. things but all of the liquor bottles were uh, attached to the very front edge of the stage because that overhung yeah. the bar yeah. area. But that meant that all of the liquor bottles were basically within access of us as band members because they were at our feet by our monitors. So, you know, <laughs> you know waste not, want not. We, 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 we basically had free access to all of the... Al- well, I say free. I don't think permission was granted, but uh, I have to apologise. I hope then it's maybe from Chicago. Say, you, you just country. had this realisation. i just seen you had this realisation all of them on. That you're yeah. just admitting of your <laughs> kleptomania. I just confessed. <laughs> confessed we did. Uh, I take full responsibility you got for this. You paid twice uh, for that gig. But yeah. That's what you're saying. We got paid twice for that gig, yeah. Uh, suffice, to, suffice to say, there was a few uh, bottles that, that were, were consumed that night. Um, by, but yeah, what a great idea. To, let's stick the band up, up in a recessed ceiling stage that overlooks the bar uh, within free reach of there alcohol. There you go. Yeah, don't put the band within arm's yeah. reach of alcohol. They do, depending on, you know, actually, some people are better, you know, when when you yeah. get up. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's cool. That band, that band was funny though. That was hilarious. That that also was one of my biggest gigs that I've ever played. We got hired to do quite a big uh, gig. It was like three thousand odd people uh, outdoor thing called Party in the mm. Park, uh, which we did, and that had a proper big outdoor venue and stage. Mm. You know, uh, full like uh, you know engineers and everything doing it. It was great, but I just remember being on stage for what would probably be the biggest gig of my life, going and playing simply red over a backing yeah. track. Yeah. This is this is this this is this is painful yeah. and bittersweet it, all at the same time. Can I not just play up on this stage like one Clapton number? <laughs> but but no. 
Mick, Mick was having Mick was having none of it. You just reminded me actually of a, a gig of quite a long time, probably the first year I was in Roadrunner. Uh, me, Ken, and Tell got together f- with um, a lady there, and you, I, can't, I think her name was Tracy, and her husband to do like a, a bit of a blues set for Wayfest. So you know, but you know, Wayfest Festival, yeah. which is a decent yeah. festival actually. Yeah, um, this would have been what about two thousand and eight. Uh, so still early days for Wayfest, and Tracy had got basically I think a half an hour slot on the second stage, the first the first slot of the day, or the second slot of the day. And it was really good fun. It was really great being at Wayfest for the day. But what I remember it was hilarious about it was the weather was so shockingly bad that day that nobody was really there for the festival for the first oh. few six. So I remember getting on stage yeah. and we were playing the first song and the crowd was one man and he'd brought his dog. <laughs> So it's the only time in my life I've ever played to one man and his dog. <laughs> Actually, I remember, remember standing there thinking, this is ironic, because over here in the UK, that's kind, it's kind of like, it's, it's like a funny phrase you use, isn't it, to say, you know, that nobody's yeah. there, just yeah. one man and his dog kind of thing. And I was like, and that, literally that literally happened. happened. <laughs> That was funny. It was a good gig in terms of when we played, sound was good. You know, we had fun doing that. But yeah, there was nobody really there. By the time we finished the set, there was probably 10, 15 people there. But at the start, it was just like literally one bloke and his little dog sat there under an umbrella. <laughs> Oh, it's so painful, isn't it, when that happens? Yeah. yeah. I didn't... There was one uh, venue... <clears throat> I mean, we, with that with Roadrunner, when we were in that band, we always generally played to pretty, you know, uh, appreciative uh, audiences that would come out to see mm. the band, um, or there would be venues that were good for live music, and so people would just come up, come and, and discover the band and, and enjoy it, which was great. But I do remember one one venue that all, I think they even wanted to hire us or did hire us for like a gig, uh, like every, every month or every, every couple of months. Uh, and they wanted us to be like their, their regular live music, uh, band, but it wasn't a pub that did live music. And so it was a really, it was a pub in hook, which is a little village in Hampshire, yeah. Surrey area. And I just remember the first gig that we did there and we thought, right, okay, we're going to help this pub get, you know, live music on, on mm. there up and running for them. And I remember the pub being really disinterested generally in, in trying to promote anything or do anything to help yeah. live music get off the ground. And I remember, yeah, there was like nobody turned up for the first gig and we, we chatted to the kind of owner and the bar staff and we were going, look, are you sure you want to have live music here? This this doesn't seem like the right venue for mm. it. But I don't remember what happened with those series of gigs. But I just remember, I just remember us thinking, why are we playing for nobody? Yeah, exactly. Nobody I think I remember here. the same one. It's a shame that the you know you have gigs like that. We were lucky with Roadrunner though that we were around for long enough and good enough that you know it didn't take as long that until we could pick and choose where we played. People were happy mm. to have us, mm. um, and we you know I think you know the last few years. Um, there were always fantastic gigs because, um, you know, you had that choice of playing the, the, the venues you enjoy playing. Um, and we did it, you know, we, yeah. like I said, we always did it for the fun of it. Uh, we were a professional band, professional outfit, and we did well, you know, to get the money we did from pubs and clubs, but that's not why we did it. Mm. It, was, it, it was always for the music and for the enjoyment of it. Um, and yeah, yeah I, I, rem- you know, I remember so many great gigs. I got to mention one more great gigging experience of mine, which wasn't with Roadrunner. Um, but again, it's about playing with friends. And it was would have been 2008, Halloween 2008. And um, a friend of mine, Anna Burton, who, great guitarist and singer, who at the time was based in Guildford, mm-hmm. she'd got a gig for, for Halloween evening on a weekend at the Tup pub in Guildford. So not a big pub, but a, quite a popular pub, and it's still there. Um, and we did, uh, we did some rehearsals. It was a great band together. It was me, my friend Owen Log on bass, Anna Burton singing and playing guitar, and a guy called Chris Nugent on drums he's just a superb rock drummer um amazing drummer and he gigs with um regularly with a lot of you know um people on the blues circuit like marcus malone he's marcus malone's drummer he's a really great uh, great drummer and we you know we dressed up properly for the halloween gig you know we all had our mm. costumes mm. on and it was so good and we did some rehearsals and we did 
a lot of stuff that we would usually say do in, in you know for pubs in the area but we did thriller as well we did our own kind of arrangement of thriller which nice. is cool we, we did monster mash we did the ghostbusters theme but what i remember the most about that night is that was around the time in, in guildford um uh, when there was a lot of you know there's a really good musicians community a lot of good jam nights around and the gig turned into a bit of a jam night so some other people that turned up and that were kind of known in the area played as well a few songs and it became a really good event you know as you know as friends you know of, of this community of people it came a nice night for those people as well to get up and play uh, but the crowd was just amazing on the night because everyone was there dressed up in Halloween you know the, the landlord had you know scheduled the event and kind of said you know this is a this is Guildford's Halloween party and it was crammed out and it was just it was just such a great great gig great night great everything was good you know it was a good sound good people you know we all played really well the crowd was fantastic it was a good night and that was you know that was one of my favorite gigs of of that kind of time you know in my life really when you know I was still living in Guildford and the community mm-hmm. there was really mm-hmm. good you know and yeah that's that's one of the that's one I'll never forget that it was really cool that sounds like the perfect gig and and as well like punctuated by a nice kind of you get to dress up and everyone's in a in a party yeah. mood as well and uh, you're playing with great musicians and yeah that that's the perfect perfect storm for a, a brilliant night exactly. isn't it? that's and and not and not too far to travel home at the end of it as well because you're, <laughs> because you're living in the same venue <laughs> <laughs> it was a great night, but it, again, it's you know the the key for me is all my best gig experiences. When I think about what are my favourite gigs that I've ever done, it's been because of the people I've been playing with and the music that yeah. we get to play, and you know, and, and not because it's a particular size of gig or you know the the kind of the grandeur of it being a particular wedding or a particular venue or anything like that. Mm. It's always been you know who who is it I'm playing with? Are they you know good friends and people that I love and people that I want to play with and venues and music that allow us to do what we want to do and have fun with it. That's that's always yeah. the best thing for me. Yeah, jam nights even some Such some jam words. nights. Well, you know, I, I I've got great memories of great jam nights. All my friends have been there and we've got up a couple of times and we've had fun. And those are almost as good memories as gigs, as proper gigs for me because the right people are there at yeah. the right time. It's great. You're so right in what you say. Um, I uh, I've done a, a few dep gigs for uh damien's band who we've spoken about on the show the dlb um we've done uh kind of me on fest little festivals and even just a couple of pub gigs Mm -hmm. and things um and again when you play with such a great group of musicians one that makes for an amazing night you know damien and and every musician that he has in his his band as a dlb are are absolutely phenomenal you know Mm -hmm. professional musicians so that that that's one thing but um we're all good friends as well. So, you know, and we had the same thing in Roadrunner. And if I think back to every band that I've really enjoyed being in and playing in throughout my kind of youth and and even now as I'm starting to, to go into another band, it's uh, it's so much about making sure that you have fun and get on with the people that you're playing yeah. with. Because, you know, even if they're great musicians or competent musicians, if, the, if that kind of... Um, team spirit and have it, you know, but, you know, looking out for each other isn't there, then it kind of, it, it makes it like a hard work kind of thing. And I, I think that's what you were talking about earlier when you were talking about doing a lot of the wedding gigs that you do, um, which is where you're literally just a gun for hire for the night. It's, it's good and you can have a good gig and musically you can, you can do some things which are fun to do, but it's, it doesn't complete the the kind of package of, of, mm. you know, being out with, with a bunch of people that you enjoy doing uh, that kind of thing with, because there's the downtime beforehand afterwards. Uh, and that all, that all kind of is part of what happens on stage as well. Having that, those kind of connections. 100%. With I mean, it, it's the main reason actually for me why I didn't pursue a full time career as a musician. You know, I took that, I took that mm. step when I, when I was 20 years old, I decided I'm going to leave my engineering career now and study music because mm. I, because mm. I, I don't want to get to a point in my life where I can't do that and then, and then wonder to myself, well, what if I didn't try kind of thing? Um, but what mm. I realized mm. over the years of studying music is that the reason I love music and love playing guitar 
guitar is because I like the way music moves me. You know, I like the way I feel when mm. I'm moved by music. And I and, and it took a few years of studying music for me to realise that um, there's there's an awful lot of compromise in being a successful musician. There's an awful lot of gigs you have to take where you're never going to be moved by the music, but you don't have a choice. And I thought, mm. well, what, what would happen if I was, you know, destitute? You know, I hadn't had a gig for a while. I was struggling to pay the bills. And, and I got a call saying, you know, you wanted for like a 12 month tour with somebody whose music I really didn't like. Um, mm. But I had no choice but to take it. And I thought I, I run the risk of killing my love for something that I really don't ever want to, you know, fall out of love with, which is music and playing guitar. Mm. Um, and I decided, well, then I, I don't think I can, I can be a professional musician. And I think a lot of people, you know, maybe they find enjoyment in it in a different way than I do. But for me, you know, I think if I was a career musician, I, um, I, I would probably fall out of love with playing guitar you know that's the, something i realized and 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 again i feel like i feel like i've proved that in talking about my favorite gigging experiences which have always been about the fun i've had the people i've played with and how the mu- music that we've played has kind of moved me and you know the crowd as well and my worst gigging experiences are, are like those professional situations where i have to play what the gig demands and um mm. you know so it's it's i feel like i've i've reinforced my life decisions <laughs> <laughs> over the years of gigging yeah you know? absolutely what a great reflection but also you know um a, a great acknowledgement for the for the folks that do do this professionally day in yeah. day out um because for them it means you know for, for, it means digging deep every yeah. day to find that that energy yeah. and that drive to to take your passion and mm. deliver it and entertain an audience and give it your mm. all because that's what the the job requires mm. it's not one of, it's not it's not a job where you know um like like you and I where you know if we're doing a, an office based job or a desk job or out you know with customers or whatever as part of our main job where if you're having a bad day you can just kind of keep your head down a little bit and uh, you know uh, keep yourself to yourself for a little mm. bit, um, you know, and then we get to go out and gig at the weekends or whatever and, and blow off some steam and, and we enjoy doing that kind of balance for, you know, for, for the professional working musicians out there, that is the day yeah, job. That exactly. is every day to, to, to bring that. And you're going to be under the yeah. lights in front of people who are, who are there to be entertained. So you can't really keep your head down and keep out mm-hmm. the way and, uh, and, and, you know, have, you know, have a bad day. So, you know, hats, hats Absolutely. off to those, those people that do Absolutely. that day in, day out i could never do it i couldn't do it um you know i mean yeah there's this kind of um you know rose tinted spectacles view of i think what it is to be you know a modern day you know working musician uh in thing you know things like that and uh, you know i think having some access to it in the sense of having some close friends who who work in that area you know i know that that for a lot of the times they don't enjoy it you know they they have Mm. their own projects and their own gigs and do their own writing on the side to, to try and try and satisfy that need to be you know moved by the thing they love um, but the things that pay mm. the bills Matt Schofield put it perfectly once who Matt Schofield's a fantastic blues guitarist and he said once that um, he doesn't get paid for the gig he said he gets paid you know when he does a gig you know for a venue with right. his band he's getting paid he said that money is paying him for the travel paying him for you know the, the bad food he's getting at garages on the way to gigs and the waiting around <laughs> and the long sound checks that's what he's getting paid for the gig that he's playing he does for free because he loves it mm. but I'm getting paid mm. for all the stuff around you know he put it perfectly I think I think that's the same for, for a lot of, of working musicians the, the the inconvenience can sometimes outweigh the convenience but you know they do it fair play to them like you say cool yeah no hats off hats off to them but look uh, hopefully uh, we are on the verge of getting out there and gigging yeah. again and uh, with lockdowns lifting and what I look forward to is coming back and revisiting this conversation with you in a few months' exactly, time yeah. to see if we've been able to add to our best or worst gig list with some yeah. with, with some some more current uh, current event things. So we're not we're not trawling our memory from from gigs of, of years gone by, but actually we were able to sit down and go. Uh, let me tell you about the gig that happened yeah. this weekend. It was an absolute blind or, or it was absolute uh, nightmare because of exactly. X, Y, and Z reason. So uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's revisit this conversation again in, in September, October, and we can, we can talk about those Amazing. gigs then. 
Good stuff, dude. Well, as always, it's been great to catch up with you this week. Good to have a chat and reminisce. Yeah, good likewise. memories. Likewise, mate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what are you up to for the for the week ahead? Anything, uh, anything that you want to talk about guitar related that we need to to reloop with well, next week, or just some more practicing or got, modding well, I've taking done some place modding recently? Haven't I? I don't think we've spoken about that. Have I've you? changed the pickup, changed the bridge pickup on the Strat to it's fantastic, uh, and we're not sponsored. I must say. Um, because whenever you recommend something, I, I feel like there needs to be disclosure. This has been purchased out of my own pocket, but yeah. I bought an Iron Gear pickups uh, jailhouse rail to for my strat, which is um, yeah. you know a single coil sized um, rail based humbucker. You know, so it doesn't have separate pole pieces, um, and it's just killer. It's absolute killer. Um, but what I also intend to do, and I've got the kit for it, but I'm waiting until um, I've kind of got past the point of using these strings. <laughs> It's terrible. You know, I'm like, I'm not, I don't know where it's That's not terrible. Strings, you know, but uh, the next mod I'm going no, to do absolutely. on the strap is I'm putting a little toggle switch in, which will bring the the neck pickup in, um, regardless of the of the of the the, the pickup position that I'm in. So basically, it means I can have yeah. the bridge and the neck on at the same time when I've got. If I flip that toggle switch on, I'm in the bridge position. I can get neck and bridge, which is telly kind of tones. Or if I'm in. Uh-huh. Uh, the second position, and I've got bridge and middle selected. If I flick that toggle switch on, it'll bring in the neck, which means I've got all the pickups on. So I've effect- I'm so effectively using it to turn <laughs> my guitar into like a seven, um, you know, mode rather than five mode pickup kind of configuration. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. the next mod I'm going to do on that, and um, and then I think I'm kind of done modding pretty much. <laughs> That's it. Oh, that's great, mate. That sounds like some brilliant mods uh, happening. Well, we should, we'll we'll um, we'll releap on that in a, yeah. in a couple of weeks once you've done that and find out anything that you kind of picked up or discovered during the process of doing that. And I've, I'm really interested. I've not heard. Uh, I have a I have an American Deluxe Strat that uh silvery one which you can see yeah. behind me which has got some some kind of similar circuitry in it which um kind of allows you to have those different kind of tonal options so i'll yeah i'll be interested to see what your strat sounds like once you've, yeah. once you've done that as well and if you if, if, if you're happy with that but yeah me that's, too that's cool man that's some great what about you Are you doing any anything in the next week uh so i i need to carve out some time to do some modding uh, mm. as you know i've got um uh the tokai gold top to to get get on with and um put some new some new pickups in there and so I've, all the uh tone caps have arrived uh uh and volume uh pots that i'm putting in and tone pots so i'm gonna i'm gonna do some new electrics on that one um and yeah uh oh and that one as well there is going to get some modding on it as well uh so yeah we're uh yeah we, we've got some less poor modding to do over the next couple of weeks um but yeah we will we will update on a whole whole new episode Fantastic. about that looking forward to it cool dude well what a cracking chat i, I feel really good after that one <laughs> that's been like another <laughs> weekly therapy session <laughs> A trip down, a trip, a trip down memory lane, and uh, re- reflecting on your life choices, and uh, and also, also paying homage to the professional musicians that do this day in day out, exactly. and uh, have the roller coaster of, of, of good and bad gigs uh, to, to kind of reflect on. Great chat, mate. Fantastic. Have a cracking week, buddy. I'll speak to you next week. Yeah, and you, mate. Take it easy. Take care, mate. Cheers, Matt. Bye. Another really interesting conversation this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Come back for more next week from the Guitar Smarts team. Come say hello to us on our social media pages. Remember to like and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss a show. Thanks again and see you soon.